The problem is you have a car that's been back to your shop a couple of times for a brake vibration and you may have already installed a new set of pads and rotors and it's a repeated comeback and it's driving your shop crazy. Here we have developed the ATA brake rotor gauge. This tool helps you to accurately diagnose brake related issues on modern vehicles that are very sensitive to brake vibration. In this video we'll be covering the function of the ATA brake rotor gauge. We'll be referring to the troubleshooting tree and the instructions that is broken down into sections. This video will follow the sections similar to the instructions. This tool is designed to very accurately measure rotor runout, hub runout, and rotor on hub runout if there's any debris in between the two, as well as brake rotor thickness variation with the rotor staying on the vehicle and saving a lot of time. We'll be working on a display for ease of visibility and on the car to show you the different aspects. Before going to this tool, make sure you follow the steps on the troubleshooting three in terms of bad tires, out around tires, bent reels, bad suspension components, etc. This is very important that you have ruled out all those things by visual inspection before going to the tool and focusing in on the brakes. We start with section A, tool installation. Here we are installing the compression ring on to the hub and rotor assembly. This compression ring has a bolt pattern that fits BMW. The tool works on any car out there regardless of what brand it is. The variation is only in the compression ring. Here we have compression rings that fits Mercedes, Porsche and Audi. We manufacture compression rings for just about any vehicle out there, Honda, Toyota, whatever it is. The only variation in the kit is the compression ring and what vehicle you're using it on. So for your application, go to AGA Tools and see if the application is available for the car you need. We are constantly coming out with new applications. Make sure the compression ring is clean on the mounting surface that goes towards the rotor. Also, make sure that the rotor is clean in the area where the compression ring makes contact. You can clean the area with a scotch pride pad like this to make sure there is no debris left on the surface. Don't worry so much about the inner rust ring buildup right here. The compression ring has a machine stepped to avoid making contact. Line up the ring with the holes and install all five bolts. You can insert a screwdriver or punch into the compression ring outer diameter to torque the wheel to the 70 newton meters or 50 foot pounds that is required. Now we're going to install the clamp on the steering knuckle. The clamp can be with no extension and just a ball medium extension or the long extension. These extensions are located right below the compression ring right here in the set and can be changed in and out with the supplied Allen wrench. Now we're going to install the clamp onto the steering knuckle. Insert it around the knuckle like this. Put it into the groove. Tighten evenly on left and right side until the clamp is securely fastened onto the steering knuckle. This clamp is extremely universal. It's designed to go on in many, many different applications. Uh, here we're using just the shock in the back, going around it, clamping onto it. Same as in the front. Divide it between the two screws. Make sure it is tight and securely clamped on. Here we can use the extension to bring the ball out further if that is needed. For instance, on an X1 chassis, where there is very few components in this area, the clamp can be installed directly onto the upper trailing arm. The next step is to 
install the clamp and the rod. The clamp goes over the ball and over the rod on the other end. You want to position the rod to where it can be moved around freely and come out approximately 90 degrees over the rotor and the hub. If you have a tight situation, you can select the shorter clamp depending on your application. Now you select a template either for the rear or the front depending on what axle you're working on. The template has two contact points that will make contact to the outer diameter rotor and a large contact point here that's going to be touching on the rotor face. Align the keyway into the keyway shaft and slide it over. Firmly press in on the template and tighten the clamp firmly by hand. Remove the template. Rotate the hub and brake assembly until the indicator is pointing straight up at 12 o'clock. If the hub and rotor is tight and will not rotate, push back the pads in the caliber a little bit until it is free. If you're working on the rear of the vehicle, make sure the parking brake is off and that the vehicle is neutral so that you can turn the rotor and hub. Next, we're going to install the gauge into the gauge head. Insert the gauge and tighten the knob. Tighten the lockout knob so that the center indicator is lined up right in the center. Remove the backstop and set it aside. Align the keyway and slide the gauge head over the rod until the contact point of the gauge touches the rotor. Continue pushing inward until the small indicator gauge is between two and three. Tighten the knob. Loosen the dial lock and turn the dial face until the needle points to zero. Slightly tighten the dial lock. This completes the tool installation, section A. Section B, measuring wheel bearing play. Grab the rotor in the 12 o'clock position and apply pressure in and out. A slight movement of the needle is okay. No play or excessive movement should be felt. If you have excessive play, replace hub or wheel bearing. Section C, measuring rotor run out. Let me take just one second and explain about the dial indicator. As you can see here, noted on the gauge face, it has five millimeters of travel and that's indicated right here on the small dial and it's showing us that it has two thousandths of one millimeter per marking on the outer face. So each notch here indicates two thousandths of a millimeter. So this would be ten thousandths, twenty thousandths, thirty thousandths, forty thousandths, and so on. The measurements given to you in the document is always in thousandths of a millimeter. Note that the min max indicators can be moved around. It's good practice to set the min and the max indicator with the variation that you are expected for the measurement that you're performing. Measuring rotor run out. We start with the top indicator in the top of 12 o'clock position. We have our gauge set with the min and the max indicator right here, 70 thousandths, which is the specification for the run out. We insert the screwdriver into the ring. Be careful not to side load it side to side as that could affect our measurement. Turn nice and slowly around. It is normal that the gauge moves a little bit when you start and you stop. Here you can already see that this rotor is far exceeding the maximum of the 70 thousandths of run out. As we turn around, here we are approaching back to the top, 360 degrees, and the indicator is back to zero. If the measurement exceeds 70 thousand, like here, go to the next section, section D. Section D, measuring hub runout 
on the compression ring. Remove the gauge head and remove the gauge from the head assembly and set the head assembly aside. Remove the gauge tip. Install the gauge extension and reinstall the tip like this. Take the extension bar and insert the gauge into the extension bar and slightly tighten the knob. Slide the gauge extension bar over the rod so that the contact point rests right on this recessed area on the compression ring. Continue pushing in until the small gauge again is between the two and the three and tighten the knob on the gauge extension bar. Note that I'm setting the min max indicator to 30, which is the specification for this measurement. And now zeroing the gauge on the dial. Rotate the hub 360 degrees while absorbing the gauge. As you can see, this greatly exceeds the 30 thousandths of runout. If you have this case scenario where the runout measured on the compression ring exceeds 30 thousandths, go to the next step in section E. If the hub runout on the compression ring is less than 30 thousandths of a millimeter, replace or resurface the rotor. Section E measuring hub runout directly on the hub. For this segment, you will need to remove the brake caliber and the brake rotor. When removing the brake caliber, you can use the AGA ratcheting tether. Uh, attach it to the chassis on the inside and attach it to the brake caliber like this. Uh, pull the caliber off and pull the ratchet tight. This avoids any unnecessary strain on the brake hose and any brake sensor leads or anything like that go into the caliber. To remove this rotor that's stuck on the hub, we recommend using the AGA brake disc remover rather than beating on the rotor, which is bad for the wheel bearing and other components. Plus, it damages the rotor. In this case, we're going to reuse it. You start with selecting the um, screws with the correct thread pits for the rotor tool. Insert the screws across from each other. Thread the screws into the hub. You slide the brake disc removal tool to the grooves in the two standoffs like this and guide the hook over the brake rotor. By hand, tighten up the 22 millimeter nut until it is in tension. Continue tightening on the wrench on the 22 millimeter nut until the brake rotor separates from the hub. When it gives this big bang and the rotor comes off, nothing falls to the ground because the rotor is captured by the screws and the tool is in the slots. Take the tool off to the side. Having them captured like this prevents the rotor from falling and damaging or hurting somebody's feet, damaging concrete floors, cracking tiles, etc. Now, because they're captured by the screws, it's necessary to support the rotor with one hand and remove the standoffs by hand one at a time. This eliminates accidentally dropping the rotor. Now that we have the rotor and hub separated, you can see the area right here and you can see the debris on the hub. It is now necessary to clean the hub very thoroughly. Now that the hub is clean, we can perform the hub runout measurement right here on the outer edge. But let me show you on the display. Now that the rotor is off, you can clearly see we had placed a very thin piece of 3M tape. This was our corporate for all the runout. 
This could just as easily have been caused by rust, debris, or other types of buildup. However, we are now going to measure directly on the face of the hub to make sure that the hub is true. Make sure the face of the hub is clean. We want to make contact on the outer portion of the hub right here where there is no interference from the hole. We're going to use the same setup, the gates installed with the extension into the gates bar like this. Slide it on, make contact on the very outer edge, bring the indicator in to where it's between two and three like before and tighten the gauge. Now zero your outer ring and carefully without side loading the hub, turn the hub 360 degrees while observing the runout on the dial indicator. As you can see, we only have a variation of two to three one thousandths of a millimeter. If the hub runout on hub is greater than 25 thousandths of a millimeter, replace wheel bearing or hub. If the hub runout on hub is less than 25 thousandths of a millimeter, install clean rotor and hub, then go to section F. Section F, brake rotor thickness variation measurement. You start with installing the backstop that we removed and set aside earlier behind the rotor in between the brake rotor and the backing plate. Slide it out until it just makes contact to the brake rotor and tighten the knob. If you have a situation where it's difficult to insert this backstop due to no clearance from the backing plate, use this ratcheting tether located in the lid of the kit to pull the backing plate back. Hook the tether to a component on the body. Hook the outer hook over the backing plate. Gently push in on the backing plate and apply pressure so that the backstop can be inserted between the rotor and the backing plate. Now that the backstop is installed, we loosen the lockup center indicator and note now that the gauge head can now pivot. Because it can pivot, it no longer follows the rotor runout, but it only measures the distance between the backstop and the dial indicator. As we turn the rotor, we'll be measuring the brake rotor thickness deviation. Here, we're looking for a very small measurement of only 30 thousandths of a millimeter. So I set the min-max indicator to 30 thousandths. Loosen the gauge knob, turn the gauge head to zero. With the indicator in the top or 12 o'clock position, slowly turn over the rotor while absorbing the gauge. It's normal that the needle moves a little bit during the start-stop. Continue turning until you're back to 12 o'clock. In this case, we had very, very little brake rotor thickness variation. If you're performing a brake rotor thickness measurement like this, and all of a sudden you have a big variation on a needle like that, and after a little bit of turning, it returns back. It could be that you have a pad transfer on the back. If rotor thickness variation is greater than 30 thousandths of a millimeter, replace or resurface rotor. If rotor thickness variation is less than 30 thousandths of a millimeter, inspect suspension components like bushings, ball joints, and etc. To order your brake rotor gauge or brake disc removal kit, go to ajatools.com. As always, thank you very much for watching and don't forget to subscribe.